welcome. Be sure to like and subscribe for more scary stories, or I will come for you. It seems that all of you have been enjoying these dark and disturbing stories. You are definitely my kind of people. Let's kick this up a notch. This first story is a personal favorite. Story number one, Diary of a Cannibal by the curator, April 12, 2015. I met him today. Well, not met exactly, but I found my next meal. I've been lurking on those dark web forums for months, putting out feelers. You never know who's going to respond to ads like willingly become my beef or dinner guest wanted. You are the main course. I get a fair number of sickos who think it's funny to play along at first until they realize I'm deadly serious. Then they always bail, calling me names, threatening to report me to the feds. Fucking pussies. But this guy, I could tell right away he was legit. He emailed me a long story about being in insurmountable debt, his wife leaving him, getting fired from his job. He said he had nothing left to live for and had been working up the courage to off himself. But then he saw my ad and figured why not get paid for someone to do it for him. We went back and forth over encrypted email, working out the financial details, how and when to meet. I tried not to get too excited at first, because like I said, guys always flake at the last second. But he kept assuring me he was 100% committed, describing in grimly poetic detail how he wanted to be bled out, butchered, and consumed. Whenever I feel the urges getting too strong, I read over that email. I have to ambush and kill many of my ingredients against their will, but there's something purer about dining on someone who has given consent, you know? We're supposed to meet up tomorrow night at 9 p.m. in the back parking lot of an abandoned Kmart on Kermak Road. Isolated area, no cameras or witnesses to worry about. Just have to pick up a few supplies after work, and then it'll be showtime. April 13th, 2015. He showed up just like he said he would. I was there early, just to make sure, heart pounding wondering if he'd get cold feet after all. But at 9.15 p.m., a beat-up old Honda pulled into the lot. I made sure to park away from the streetlights, and I was in my van, which has no windows, so I just stayed put and watched to see if it was him or some random person. Sure enough, about a minute later, my phone vibrated. It was the coded message we'd agreed on, letting me know it was him. I fired up the van and drove over, getting my supplies. Leather restraints, zip ties, duct tape, syringe, and bottle of concentrated sedatives from my little mobile kitchen in back. Trying not to seem too eager, I knocked on his window. When he rolled it down, I was relieved to see it really was the guy from the profile pics he'd sent. You're Michael? I asked, using the false name he'd given me. He nodded, looking terrified. Trunks open, he said, voice shaking. We didn't say anything else. I just opened the van's side door, grabbed my bottle of sedative, filled the syringe, and quickly stuck it in his arm and pushed the plunger. He was out like a light in maybe 15, 20 seconds. I made sure he was secured in his seatbelt put his car in neutral and pushed it out of the way, then grabbed him under his armpits and dragged him into the van. I always line it with triple thick contractor bags so any leaks or stains won't seep into the floor. Makes for easy cleaning. I stripped off his shirt, shoes and pants so just in his underwear, cuffed and tied him up good. He never even flinched. As I got in the driver's seat and pulled out of the lot, I almost couldn't believe my luck. After so many flakes and near misses, I'd finally gotten one to go through with it right to the end. I drove straight home, not even stopping for food. 
I knew the feast that awaited me back at my place. When I pulled into my garage, I backed the van in so I could unload him into the basement. My basement is basically a big walk-in freezer with a drain in the middle of the floor for easy cleanup. I tied him to the big meat hook I have dangling from the ceiling joists and settled in to wait for him to wake up. The sedative should wear off in about six hours, so I had some time to kill. I flipped on the portable TV. I keep down there and turned it to a random movie to pass the time. Around 4 a.m., I heard a faint groan and saw his eyelids fluttering. I shut off the TV so there'd be no distractions. This was going to be a special night. I could almost smell the meat cooking already. April 14th, 2015. He woke up screaming, confused and terrified, just like they all do. When he finally stopped yelling himself hoarse, I turned on the harsh utility lights and he blinked at me in confusion. You, he finally sputtered out. Relax, Michael. I told him, using air quotes on the name he'd given me. We're just getting started. But, but you can't do this. I only agreed because I wanted the money. For you to kill me. Not, not this. He started trying to squirm out of the restraints, kicking his bare feet helplessly. I just smiled and walked over to my stainless steel workbench, where all my tools were laid out. Well... You didn't exactly specify how you wanted to be killed. Don't worry. I'll make sure to get the money, or whatever's left of it, after I take my... processing fee back to your family. No. No, no. Please. I'll get you the money another way. I'll give you whatever you want. Double. Triple. I chuckled at that picking up a boning knife and giving it a few practice slices through the air. Sorry, Michael, but you agreed to be the payment. He saw the hunger in my eyes and renewed his struggles, tears starting to stream down his cheeks. Please, I have two little kids. A boy and a girl. What am I supposed to tell them? Tell them. Their daddy got a little parental guidance from his butcher. I laughed which just set him off screaming again. As I approached him with the knife, he squeezed his eyes shut, blubbering too hard to even make any noise. But I just wanted to have a little fun for now. I tied a thick leather strap between his legs, cinching it up tight so it cut into his inner thighs so he couldn't move or roll away from the blade. Then I started slicing shallow cuts into his belly, just a little at a time, not too deep, enough to draw blood which started dripping into a little puddle at his feet. Every time he cried out, I'd smile and let him know this was nothing compared to what was still to come. After working on his stomach for a while, I climbed up on a stool and began on his chest and shoulders, with the knife strokes harder and deeper so it would really start to hurt. Before long, he was drenched in sweat and his own hot, sticky blood. I took an extra chunk out of his left pec for good measure, a deep gouge right into the muscle. That's when he finally passed out from the trauma and pain. That was fine by me. I had a little snack while he was out, carefully frying up the slice I'd cut from his chest and a little butter over my camp stove. I ate it with some fresh garlic and herbs. Tough and a little chewy but that unmistakable rich, metallic flavor of prime human meat. Oh, I was in for a real treat this time. I let him come to about an hour later. When I saw him start stirring and fluttering his eyes again, I stuck an old sweat sock in his mouth and secured it with duct tape so his screams would be muffled. Don't want to disturb the neighbors. I decided to give him one more chance to back out if he really wanted. With the sock stuffed in, all he could do was furiously shake his head and let out these pathetic, gurgling whimpers. I slowly dragged the tip of the knife down his sweaty, blood-smeared face. This is your last chance, I told him softly. 
nod if you still give me your consent to proceed with. Processing you. Just a little head shake, and I'll spare you and let you go. Though you'll never find all the pieces of your Honda scattered around the county. I chuckled again at my little joke. He must have believed me because he paused for a long while, frantically working the sock gag out of his mouth with his teeth and tongue to have a chance to speak. When he finally got it loose enough, he was sobbing so hard it was a minute before he could speak. Please, don't eat me. I'll do anything, anything, he finally wailed. Anything, I repeated. Well, if anything is on the table, I choose dinner. And with that, I jammed the gag back into his mouth and gave him a vicious backhanded strike across the face that made his entire body swing wildly from the hook. As he spun back around, I grabbed a filleting knife and sliced off his right ear, causing a new torrent of screams and causing blood to gush down the side of his face. Should have listened when I gave you an out, Mikey. I scolded, inspecting the bloody hunk of cartilage for a moment before gobbling it down. Not much meat, but the savory crunch was nice. That slice seemed to snap the last bit of ludicrous hope he had that I'd ever let him go. Now, it finally dawned on him that I really was going to slaughter him, bit by bit, and devour every last scrap of flesh from his body. The reality seemed to drain the fight from him, and he went mercifully limp, softly weeping as I took out a larger butcher's knife and started separating his left foot at the ankle. April 15th, 2015. I must have blacked out from exhaustion at some point, because next thing I knew, the harsh utility lights were off and streaks of watery dawn sunlight were creeping in through the basement's tiny windows. My knives and cloths were set aside on the steel tables, dark, rust-brown stains everywhere. I felt sticky, dried blood caked all over me like glue from head to toe. I looked over at the meat hook, expecting to see his mutilated, unrecognizable remains still dangling there. But the hook was empty. It was gently swaying back and forth and dripping something in big globs to the already congealed puddle on the floor. It took another few seconds for my sleep-addled brain to process what had happened. Then I saw the lumpy, tarp-covered mounds on my workbench, and it all came rushing back. I'd had the meal of a lifetime, savoring every single bite and sliver of meat over many, many hours of meticulous butchering and separating. Then I'd blacked out from a food coma like no other. I rushed over and pulled back the tarps, shuddering in deep satisfaction at the sight of all the thick, beautiful cuts. Butterfly pork chops from his legs, ribeyes from his back, tenderloins from... Well, you know, I'd expertly cracked open his ribcage too and extracted the organs, separating them into plastic bags. I'd even set aside his plump sausage links and Rocky Mountain oysters for specialty meals down the road. There was easily a freezer full of meat, and I knew I wouldn't want a single bite of anything else for weeks. As I stood there admiring my hard work and grinning from ear to ear, I thought back to the fantastic final moments. After carefully slicing each perfect cut from his body, I'd propped what was left of his torso up on some crates so his head was upright. Still barely conscious from the shock and pain, tears and gobs of drool leaking from the corners of his mouth behind the rag gag. I made sure to look him square in his hollow, vacant eyes as I brought the first chunk of his flesh to my lips, giving him a ceremonious little wink and nod. Then I slipped the tender, bloody morsel into my mouth and slowly, luxuriously chewed, savoring the wild, sweet, yet salty flavor that danced across my tongue. It really was better than any pork, beef, or chicken I'd ever had. The unmistakable flavor of human, still tinged with just a slight, coppery undercurrent of fear and despair. 
I cherished every bite I carved off his body over those next few hours. As his existence faded away and my dinner reached its messy, gaudy conclusion. Now it's time to start preparing the meat for storage. I grabbed a big, razor-sharp cleaver from the rack and went to work slicing up the larger hunks into more manageable bacon, steaks, and roasts. Still plenty of meat left on the bones, too. So I'm going to simmer those into a rich bone broth for the next few days. After a long night of imbibing the ultimate feast, I need to replenish my electrolytes and keep my strength up. Because thanks to Michael, meat's back on the menu. Story number two. I'll try to summarize what happened as best I can, but fair warning, this story is seriously fucked up. I don't really know how to write well, so sorry if it's all over the place. It started a couple months ago. My wife, Karen, had been battling ovarian cancer for two years. We had tried every treatment available, but nothing seemed to be working. She was getting weaker by the day, and the medical bills were through the roof, even with insurance. I was desperate to find something, anything that could help. That's when I started looking on the dark web. I know, super illegal and stupid, but I was at my wit's end. There were all these experimental drugs and treatments that hadn't been approved yet. People selling them under the table. I figured it was worth a shot if it could save Karen's life. At first, I was really paranoid about it. Just copying and pasting weird coded links, sending crypto payments to anonymous wallets. But after a while, I got more comfortable with the process when nothing bad happened. The drugs seemed to be working okay for Karen, too. She was having less nausea and more energy. Then one day in December, I got a weird email. It was from some Russian.ru address I didn't recognize. The subject line said human trial, cutting edge bioweapon antidote 121781A. The email was a video link and some text in broken English. It said something like, new treatment to reverse effects of Russian bioweapon. Watch video proof. Doctor ingests. Must act fast. Sell limited supply. Payment in Bitcoin. Obviously, it sounded shady as hell. Could be some scammy virus. But the idea of it being a legitimate treatment with video proof got me curious against my better judgment. The bioweapon part seemed overdramatic, though, but who knows? I remember thinking, if this is some antidote for some crazy Russian virus weapon, maybe it could help with Karen's cancer. If it was legitimately curing people, it was worth looking into. So I clicked on the video link, and that's where everything went off the deep end. The video was super clear quality, looked like it was filmed in some expensive lab or medical facility. It opened on some balding Russian scientist with a thick accent talking to the camera. Greetings. You are about to view video archive documentation of trial studies for the biological weapon codenamed Sinaev-38. This is a highly classified Russian nerve agent capable of immobilizing and killing any living organism through. He then launched into some long-winded scientific explanation about RNA replicating or some complicated rubbish. The gist was that it attached to living cells and basically scrambled the RNA so it couldn't perform any functions, which he said meant it would paralyze and then slowly kill whatever it infected over a week or two. I'll admit, at this point I started feeling a bit queasy. I wasn't expecting some weird Russian double UMD video. This was giving me serious Dexter Lumberjack vibes, if you know what I mean. Still, morbid curiosity made me keep watching against my better judgment. The scientist dude finished his spiel, then it cut to the trial studies he had mentioned. This is where shit got real. It showed a young guy, 
maybe late 20s, sitting in a basic interrogation room type setting. He looks scared out of his mind, hands cuffed to a table, wearing only boxers. The Russian guy walked in, wheeling a tray of syringes and vials filled with this thick green liquid that looked like grotesque stew. The scientist said something in Russian, and this huge guard stepped into view and just cold cocked the guy, laid him out, split his eyebrow wide open. While he was dazed, the scientist filled a syringe with the green bile and jabbed it into the side of the guy's neck like a frigging dart. The needle gauge must have been huge because this gross oozing stream of the green shit leaked out down the guy's shoulder while he was still out cold. When the guy came to, he started panicking and thrashing around like he was having a seizure. The scientist calmly mentioned something like observing weapon, introduction, massive, understatement. From there, I won't go into all the gory details, but that poor bastard basically turned into a real-life version of that zombie rage virus from 28 days later over the next week or so. He went through every horrific stage you can imagine. At first, it was just weakness, cold sweats, vomiting. Then came bouts of psychosis and temporary paralysis, where his muscles would seize up randomly. Apparently, the nerve agent was working its way through his whole nervous system. During the lulls, the scientists would run tests, drawing blood and doing other shit. They had cameras set up everywhere in his holding cell and didn't turn them off even when he had to use a bedpan or take sponge baths from a nurse in a hazmat suit. It was all just so clinical and removed how they treated him like a lab experiment as his body withered away. I felt sick watching it. Then once he hit end stage, all higher brain functions stopped. His muscles went completely rigid, like a full body cramp. His eyes rolled back in his head, and his limbs started twisting into a disturbing, unnatural angle. The scientist said this was the total neural overload shutting everything down. He drooled constantly, couldn't speak, had no control over bodily functions. At that point, he was just a husk of meat sloshing in its own feces and vomit, occasionally vomiting up blood or bile to gasping breaths. The scientists got excited over the terminal degradation transformation phase, though, so I guess it meant the weapon was working. They kept filming for another few days, until his organs finally gave out from all the damage. The video cut out when his chest stopped moving. The soldier checked his vitals and just shook his head. No food, water, organs fried to the point where he just wasted away excruciating and painful as hell. The scientist called it a confirmed expiration. That's when the English text popped up, offering their limited supply of the supposed antidote or cure for Bitcoin. Like I was supposed to willfully sign up for this after witnessing that. I slammed my laptop shut, shaken to my core and trying not to puke my guts out. What the fuck kind of demented human experiments was I watching? Definitely the most sadistic and depraved thing I'd seen in my life. I poured myself some whiskey with shaky hands to try and calm my nerves. All I could picture was that poor guy's face contorted in agony, soulless eyes rolling back as his body just quit on him over a couple weeks. It was straight up torture porn. I don't know how anyone could do that to another human being and call it science. After an hour of staring into space, horrified, the stupidest thought crossed my mind. What if the antidote could cure Karen? What if it really did reverse the effects of that nightmare poison? I'm not proud of it, but if it was legitimate, I probably would have paid for that antidote and injected it straight into her veins on the spot if I thought it could help. I was in such a dark place, emotionally, and she was suffering so much. I don't care how fucked up it was. I would have considered anything to save her at that point. That's when I realized I needed to make some serious life changes. Cancer, 
had turned me into someone willing to buy into Russian bioweapon experiments on the dark web, just on some inhuman vendor's word. How far I had fallen. I deleted that email, cleared my browsing history, anything related to those illegal purchases on the dark web. I couldn't go down that road anymore, no matter how desperate I got. It was a grim realization that Karen's cancer would eventually take her from me. But I had to find peace with it and make her remaining days as comfortable and filled with happiness as possible. Instead of looking for insane cancer miracle cures, I contacted palliative care. They got her on a routine of painkillers, anti-nausea medicines, and gave us resources for in-home hospice nurses. Just all around, much better care for end of life than some shady Russian bioweapon bullshit. Karen passed away two months later, but she was at peace. Her daughter and I were by her side. We had said everything we needed to say to each other, no regrets. It was one of the most heart-wrenching yet beautiful experiences just being there as she slipped away after watching that poor guy's torture video where all human dignity was stripped away. Cancer is a vicious beast, and we did everything we could those last months with her were precious. I'll never look back on that dark, depraved path I started going down to find solutions. Some lessons you have to learn the hard way, I guess. Maybe this story can steer others away from that pit of desperation before it's too late. Hug your loved ones. Don't take life for granted. It all can be gone far too quickly and messily. Just focus on what matters most while you can. Story number three. This story is 100% real, I swear. It's one of those things you hear about happening to other people, but never think it will happen to you. Well, it happened to me, and I'm still messed up over it. I guess I should start from the beginning. I'm a 32-year-old guy living in Michigan. Got a decent job girlfriend, dog, the usual. In my free time, I've always been into exploring the darker sides of the internet out of morbid curiosity. The deep web, red rooms, gore sites, all that disturbing stuff. I know it's stupid and dangerous, but it was almost like an addiction for me, seeing how far down the rabbit hole I could go. One night I was bored and feeling that itch. So I fired up the Tor browser and started doing my usual crawls. I ended up on this site called All Eyes on Me that had endless videos and live streams of people being tortured and killed in extremely brutal ways. The site looked really professionally done, not like the usual sketchy gore sites. There were user profiles, chat rooms, categories for different types of content. It was really sick. Part of me was disgusted, but another part was weirdly fascinated. I started mindlessly clicking around, going deeper into different sections. There was one video that looked recent of a woman getting her face smashed in with a hammer. It seemed way too realistic and I felt ill watching it. In the comments, people were saying things like the cinematography on this one is amazing. And take this down. It's too far even for this site. I'm not going to lie. I watched way more than I'd care to admit. At some point, maybe after an hour or so, my computer completely froze and crashed. Not a huge deal. I figured I must have clicked on some malware or something. I did a hard reset, and when my computer booted back up, everything seemed fine. But then a window popped up that just had my full name, home address, and a date and time about three weeks from now. Nothing else. No other text, just those details about me and that date slash time. I felt a chill go down my spine. I tried closing the window, but it was locked. I tried reopening my browsers, and it would just reappear over top of them. No matter what I did, I couldn't get rid of it, cautiously. I unplugged my internet and turned off my computer completely. After taking a few minutes to collect myself, I booted it back up 
and the window was still there. At this point, I was pretty freaked out. I ran a full malware scan, but it didn't detect anything. No keyloggers, no viruses, nothing. The window with my details was now just the desktop background burned into the display. I tried resetting, reinstalling Windows, everything, but it never went away. Over the next few days, I became sort of obsessed with trying to figure out what the hell was going on. I was losing sleep, calling in sick to work, just totally consumed by this thing on my computer. The date embedded in the window was May 12th at 3 a.m. I didn't know what it meant or what was going to happen, if anything. Part of me thought it might be some sort of sick prank, but my gut told me there was something much more sinister behind it. As that date got closer and closer, I spent every waking minute worried and terrified. I tried reaching out to some internet security forums for help, but most people thought I was just describing a bad virus and didn't take me seriously. I thought about going to the cops, but figured they would just laugh at me and not believe this was really happening. Then the day finally came. May 12. I triple locked every window and door, pulled the curtain shut, and just started my fearful waiting game. My girlfriend was out of town, so at least I didn't have to worry about her. 2 a.m. passed, then 3 a.m. 3.30, nothing. No knocks on the door, no suspicious noises, no signs of anything out of the ordinary. I started to breathe a sigh of relief, thinking maybe it was all just an elaborate prank after all. I started to finally relax a little bit, and even felt kind of silly for getting so worked up over some cryptic message on my computer. But then, at around 4 a.m., I heard the unmistakable sound of someone trying to open the front door. My heart immediately sank into my stomach. I froze in sheer terror, not making a sound, hoping against hope that maybe it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. But it wasn't. Whoever or whatever was out there started viciously pounding and kicking at the door, shaking the entire frame. I could hear muffled shouting and what sounded like tools being used to try to pry it open. I've never experienced such sheer, primal fear in my entire life. The pounding and shouting went on for what felt like an eternity. I was cowering in the corner of my bedroom, clutching a baseball bat that wouldn't do any good against whoever was trying to break in. Eventually, after what must have been 30 minutes, the noises stopped. A dead silence. I didn't move a muscle, waiting and listening, my entire body drenched in a cold sweat. Then, suddenly, I heard smashing noises coming from the other end of the house. They had gotten in through the back patio door. My blood turned to ice in my veins as I heard heavy booted footsteps quickly approaching my location. I knew there was nowhere for me to run or hide. The bedroom door kicked open and before I could even process what was happening, an enormous figure in a mask descended on me. I took a swipe at them with the baseball bat, which they easily deflected, sending it clattering to the floor. With one swipe of their arm, they sent me flying backwards into the wall, temporarily knocking the wind out of me. As I gasped for air, they were on top of me, raining down punch after punch until I was barely conscious. The next thing I knew, I was bound and gagged, being dragged out of my house and thrown into the back of a van. There were at least three other massive figures surrounding me, wearing the same creepy masks. I couldn't make out any distinguishing features. The van started moving, and one of the guys leaned down and got right in my face. In a disguised voice, he said the most bone-chilling thing I've ever heard. You wanted to be watched? Now you'll be watched by everyone. There are a lot of sick people out there who are going to have a great time with you. He let out a sinister laugh as I felt the van take a turn, carrying me off to what I can only imagine will be a living hell. I have no idea what's in store for me, 
but I've never been more terrified in my entire life. If you're reading this, please, get off those messed up sites and that dark web stuff. Don't end up like me. Once they have you in their sights, there's no way out. This is The Curator. I hope you've enjoyed today's scary stories. Until next time. <laughs>